All right, welcome to lecture nine for the um, course Mathematics of Data Models, uh, CS2810. This is a Northeastern University uh, class. Okay, today we're going to talk about projection and errors. So we previously learned about the concept of span in the previous lecture. The red line here is essentially the span of the vector 1, 0. So the vector 1, 0. And if you remember, the span is everywhere, which, which that if you multiply some constant by 1, 0, it could reach. So any number you can pick for alpha 2, for example, then this point you can reach. Therefore, everywhere along this, along this line is essentially the span of, um, of this vector. Now, if we have a point at 2, 1, right? 2, 1. If we have a point here, is this within the span? Well, no, because no matter how you, how you draw this line, you can never reach this point, right? Therefore, it's, it's not in the span. And uh, you can see it here. No matter what constant you multiply, it can never reach. So, if a point is not in the span, when you try to use this vector to approximate this point, you are never ever going to reach this point. The closest you can get to this point is right here. You're always going to be stuck on this line, and therefore the closest point to the, your target is here. And therefore, you're going to have some kind of distance. This distance here is what we call the error. So if you were to try to use this vector, the span of this vector, to reach this, this, this point, you're always going to have some error. Now, the purpose of today's lecture is essentially see if we can achieve the best approximation given a set of orthonormal bases. So that requires us to know what orthonormal basis and how to calculate the error. So how, how do we find the best approximation and error? Well, with the simplest case that we just saw, right? What is the alpha that will give us the least error? Well, if you multiply this vector by two, two, right? Then you're going to have two zero and two zero this point is the closest you're going to get. You can kind of, you can just visually see that, right? Since this is the close point, the error would be you take this point, which is two, one, and then this point, which is two, two, you subtract the difference, right? Once you subtract the difference, that will give you zero, one. And if you were to find the distance of zero, one, the L2 norm, that gives you one, which is this distance essentially. And that gives you the error. Now, this is a very simple case. Therefore, you can visually tell what alpha should be, right? How far should you make this line here so that it's closest? So in this case, we can visually see it. Now, this alpha here, which is however much you multiply, it's, we're going to call it the coefficient or the coordinate. Okay, you multiply by some coefficient and that gives you the closest approximation. Okay, so this case was easy. Let's look at a more complicated case. Now, instead of, instead of um, uh, trying to predict using like a nice line here, we try to do it here, okay? In this case, in this case, the closest point is the red dot. But how do we find the red dot is much more complicated, okay? Like previously, we know how to find the red dot. But this case, how do we find the red dot? You, we can't just eyeball it. Like we can't say this is like 2.23 or 2.1 something. Like that's not going to be accurate. How do we calculate it, All right? So the idea of, of basically coming 
up with the red point where you take this and you draw a vertical line down. The process of doing this is called projection. It's like casting a shadow. So if this is the ground, the sun is here, it's casting a shadow. And once you cast the shadow, you will know where the shadow point lies. Okay. So in any case, in this, in this case, it's no longer clear where the red point is. So how do we find the red point? The way we would say this, so this point is 2, 1, okay? 2, 1. And this, this axis is 2, 0 0.5, okay? So that goes here, this goes here. So what we want to do is we want to project this onto this. So this is projection. We want to basically project this line onto this line. In other words, we want to cast a shadow from here down. Okay? So the first step you want to do, because you want to cast it onto this line, is you want to know what is the length of one. So this this is this is the size of one. So instead of using the original vector, which is two five, we wanna we wanna normalize it so that we're talking about just length of one. The reason why we want to find the length of one is because we want to know exactly along this vector, right? Exactly along this vector where this point is. So if we start with a unit vector of length one, and if it's two times that, or 2.2 .2 times that, so, so by knowing how much is length of one, we know exactly the length going this way, okay? So first, because we're projecting onto this, we want this line to be a unit vector, so we normalize it. When we normalize this, it's approximately some kind of vector like this. So this right here is length of one, okay? This right here is length of one, 9.7, 2.4. So 9.7 to approximately here, that is the length of one. Okay, now remember this and this, Right, this is the normalized version and this is the original vector. The two of them, the two of them are pointing in exactly the same direction. It's just one is the length of one and the other one is longer. The only difference between them is the size. Okay, so this is one, this is longer. So the goal now is we now know how much is the length of one. So how long should this be? so that it's approximately equal to two, one, which is this point. So let me say that again. Basically we have this vector, which is the length of one. How many times we should multiply by length of one so that it will reach this point, red dot, such that it's as close to the blue dot as possible. Okay, so so we want to find alpha such that this is as close to our target as possible. Now, rem uh, remember, I call this normalized version x hat, okay? X hat is the like a standard symbol we used for normalization. And now that we have this problem posed, it's as simple as finding alpha. So all we need to know is alpha. What is then, what is then alpha? Okay, well, it turns out that alpha is really easy to find, All right? Remember, this is the problem and we wanna find alpha, All right? Alpha, it turns out, the best alpha turns out to be x transpose times y. So this is y, All right? x hat is here, x hat. So if we have x hat transpose times y, that is equal to alpha, so this is, this is a key point you want to realize. Once you have normalized this vector, to find out how long this vector should be to be at the projection, 
is simply x hat. Now, remember the hat. This means x is normalized. Transpose with uh, multiply by y. And that's it. That's it. This is how you find alpha. Therefore, now that you know alpha, which is how long you should multiply this vector by, you actually multiply it. Right? So alpha is equal to this. I'm going to plug this in. So here's the equation. To find this red point, which is, I'm going to call it x projection, because we, it's the x, along the x line that was projected. So this red point is equal to alpha times x hat. And since alpha is simply equal to x hat transpose y, I'm plugging that in right here. And if I just multiply this out, x hat uh, transpose times y times x hat again, okay? And that will give us this vector. And this is the location of the red dot. Let's see if it makes sense. 2.12, 2.12, somewhere around here. 0 0.53, somewhere about here. Yeah, so you see? This, this here is very, very important. Like this is a key realization. Now, um, the proof of this is related to the fact that it's a cosine. Uh, I have to think about the proof. I don't remember proof, but do you... <laughs> Do you really wanna do you want me to spend the whole class proving this? I, I doubt you want me to I doubt you want me to spend the whole class proving this. But anyways, this this is just a key thing you need to remember. Once when you're doing projection, you want to draw a line down here. And and uh, and when when you want to draw a line, you first normalize it and you find out how long this is. Therefore, how many times you should multiply the original unit vector? Um, yeah, yeah. I'm not. I, I have an idea how to prove this, but I'm not going to prove it here. Just, just remember this is this is a fact. Okay. Anyways, now that we know what this point is, the projection. Once you know the projection, this implies that you can now find the error, right? You can simply subtract the two points and find a distance between them. So you take y and subtract the projection, and then you take an L2 norm, L2 norm. And that's it. That's your error. This is your error. Okay, so we would describe the whole thing. What we just did is we have vector y, and we're projecting y onto x. Okay, and I will to go. Let's go over the key steps. If you have vectors x, y, and x, and you're projecting y onto x, like this, then the step one is to normalize x as x hat. We're normalizing x as x hat. So normalize it so we know exactly the vector of just length one. And then we need to know how many times we will multiply that by, and we call that alpha. Alpha is x hat times y, or x hat dot y. And then now that we know alpha, the location of x projection is just alpha times x hat. That, that's it. That's it. So now you know how to find the red dot. And then the error is basically the final location that, you, that your target subtract the closest you have. Okay. All right. So let's uh, take a moment. Let's say we have two vectors, u and v. What is resulting vector if you try to project u onto v? u onto v. u, v. Okay. I mean, over here is really, really obvious. Right. If you do a projection, it's going to be right here, 0 0.5. But like instead of just looking at it, Ideally, you want to go through the four steps that we just talked about. And by going through those four steps, you can really convince yourself that this is how the projection is done. Okay.
So pause the video, give it a try, and then I'm going to move on. Now, after, after you convince yourself this, let, let's try another one. This time, is we're going to do it backwards. We're going to project V onto you. So this is V. And to project it onto you, then it's going to draw a line this way. Okay? So the projection is going this way now. So, all right, let's try it. You know, remember the four steps that we do? See if you can do it. All right? Pause the video and do it, and then uh, I'm going to move on now. So hopefully you got the same, right? The first thing you do, because you're projecting onto you, is that you want to normalize you. So after you normalize it, it should look something like this. And the projection, you just follow the formula, right? U times uh, V times U. If you do this out, you should get this. Okay. Projection onto multiple vectors. So let's say we want to project the point S. So where's S? The vector S. So vector S onto V1 and V2. So I'm going to call this V1 and I'm going to call this V2. Okay. Oh, I wrote it's actually V and U. So V and U. So that's right. I just, I have a typo here. It should be V and U. V and U. There we go. Anyway, so I have S, this vector, and we want to do a projection here and then a projection here. So like this. Notice that's like 90 degrees over here as well. Notice that's 90 degrees. So that's uh, the only difference. Everything is the same. We're just doing it twice. Okay, that's the only only thing with projecting onto two. And you can project onto three, onto four, whatever. So let's follow the step again. We're going to normalize V and normalize U. After you normalize each one of them, V hat is one zero. U hat is one over square root of two and one over square root of two. So we follow the equation for projection. We've done this a couple times. So we project onto V and project onto U, okay? Notice this normalized version. And now I'm gonna get V uh, projection and U projection. So the final final uh, red dot, remember the red dot for first and the second. Now, you so far, nothing has changed, right? So far, nothing has really changed in terms of doing projection. The point I want to make here is that if you were if you were to project s and v uh, s onto u and v okay the summation of v projection and u projection does not add up to the point s so after you've done the projection v and u right which results in 1 0 and 3 over 2 if you were to add them together it does not equal to the target. So don't confuse projection with solving the problem. Okay, don't, don't confuse that. So you have a projection. This is different from when we're doing Gaussian elimination. Okay, so the fact that they don't equal to each other there's something special to it. Is that, well, why would you even think that the summation would ever add up to S in the first place? Well, first of all, I don't want you to confuse this with Gaussian elimination. But second, second, if somehow they do end up adding to S, if somehow, okay, somehow is the key, they do add up to S, which would imply that this is the projection matrix for V, and this is the projection for, for, for U, okay? If they add up to equal to S, okay? Like this, oh, you, you gotta, like over here, you gotta really pay attention. Remember, 
Remember this equation and this equation. They're just the final point, and which is VP and UP. And I, over here, I just showed you that they're not the same as S, okay? But if they did equal to S, if somehow this is true in con contradicting this, then, then we can do a little bit of math, okay? So let's copy this. Let's copy this right here, okay? If we copy this here, this implies that, well, this is a constant. This is a constant, so I can pull them out. So now I can pull them into this form. So notice if I multiply this down and this down. So they're the same thing. And I'm going to call this A, and I'm going to call this A transpose. Uh, well, A transpose S. Yeah, that makes more sense. Because this is A, and this is A transpose S. Anyways, and 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 we are saying that somehow, somehow is the key, that it equal to S. If this is the case, it will imply that what is a? It's just the first vector and the second vector. So that's that's what a is. And I'm gonna copy this over here. So a copy here, this copy here. And what is s? S is one, two. That's your target. So if they if they somehow did add up to it, it would imply that the solution to this linear system, okay, the solution to this is simply s times the transpose of v and s times the transpose of u hat that's what that's what it's saying like we actually know the solution and i can pull s out therefore it's just this is just a transpose times s now this means that the solution of the linear system ax times s is just a transpose s this is much easier than Gaussian elimination. Like before, you have to do augmented matrix, blah, 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 A inverse. Now, if, if somehow, somehow, if somehow this is true, under these conditions, the solution X is just, it's just a multiplication. You didn't need, you don't need to do Gaussian elimination or you don't need to do the inverse. It's just S, which is your target, target times A transpose. That is really, really easy. So I just showed you that it didn't happen like this. I just showed you that when we add them together, it's not true. So why are we spending so much time in the case that it happened to be true? Well, it's because it happens actually quite often. All right. It happens in a special condition, special condition, where the projection coefficients is indeed the solution. This is when the basis, okay, if the basis are orthonormal. So I think I think we learned about the concept of orthonormality last class. But this time, I'm kind of telling you why it's so special. If you happen to have the basis that are orthonormal, okay, which means that A times A transpose is equal to identity. If you happen to have this condition, then the solution to a um, linear system is super easy, okay? Now, let's do a quick example. Here's our target, X, and we have the bases, V and U, okay? So these, uh, happens to be orthonormal. So let's let's first notice that the basis is orthonormal. So if I let's stack V together, so the first multiplication is V transpose V, like this. So V came from here. Now, if I take the inner product of an orthonormal basis with itself, like orthonormal like vector with itself, we should get one. And because they're orthonormal, when you multiply with something else that's not itself, you'll get a zero. 
and then you repeat again. This one multiply here, you should get a zero because they're not the same vector. And again, over here, you should get a one because they are the same vector. So remember, if you have two vectors, V1, uh, you have a vector V1, and it's, if it's like unit vector, then V1 transpose V1 is equal to 1. Okay? So that, that's what that means. Okay. Anyways. So now we're going to pre perform projection. So basically what we showed here is a test for orthonormality. Okay? You have set of bases. And if you stack them vertically and then multiply them, you're going to get identity. That, that is the test for orthonormality basis. Okay, so now we're going to perform projection. So for projection V, we did the projection several times. It results in 3 fourths and 3 fourths. And the projection U, again, same process that we've been doing. Notice that in orthonormal basis case, Okay, now that I found the projection, what happens if I add them up? Well, if I add them up, guess what? This is equal to the target. Exactly as that what I just told you. I just I just told you guys that this is under very special case, under very special case, when the bases are uh, orthonormal, I when you add them together, you, you're going to get you're going to get the original target. Okay. Notice that in orthonormal basis, when you add them together, it is equal to the target. Okay. Well, this implies that the solution for Gaussian elimination, the solution for Gaussian elimination, if we have this equal to the target. Okay. This is the orthonormal basis, okay? The solution for A and B is simply, so this is A, this is Y. So it's simply A transpose Y. That's it. That's it. So under this solution, it is very, very easy to solve for a Gaussian elimination. Now, this is so important that, like, you take a second, like, and test it out for yourself. Like notice that if you just multiply them, all right, this is going to give you the solution. Okay. Now, we imagine if you have to do Gaussian elimination by hand with this. This would not be fun. Well, actually, this is not that bad. But they're they're harder ones. Imagine a bigger matrix that you have to do Gaussian elimination. It's much much easier if you just do multi matrix multiplication. So. This, this question will be on the exam. And if you don't know this property, it will take you forever. It will take you forever to solve the Gaussian elimination. I have a feeling um, that I have, for the last exam, the reason why some of you could not finish the exam is because you don't have a lot of the, a lot of the tricks that um, I've taught you, like really, really well remembered. But this time, uh, I'm making it very explicit. You, if you see orthonormal basis, if you see orthonormal basis, and you try to do Gaussian elimination, it will take you a long time, and it's it's just gonna waste your time in the exam. Okay, so this this is very important. Orth the orthonormal basis. Now, this property is so special. It makes our life so much easier. Basically, all the linear algebra proofs work very hard to make sure they're working orthonormal basis. So having orthonormal basis makes your life a lot easier. And very often, people try to create orthonormal basis and work within the normal ba orthonormal basis instead of any random basis. Okay, so we talked about how to... I Identify orthonormal bases. You can tell if these U and V are orthonormal bases, right? By first, we stack them vertically. So take this V and then U. 
So we stack them into a matrix, and we'll call that A. Okay, we call that A, matrix A. And then we multiply A transpose A. If A transpose A is equal to identity, then it is an orthonormal basis. So that's how you can tell if, if a set of bases is an orthonormal basis. And you can look at this example here, right? I stack them after, sorry, I stack them. After I stack them, I multiply by its transpose and I get a one, one. So this confirms that these bases are orthonormal. This implies that for orthonormal bases, there's a very special relationship. It implies that A inverse for these is just A transpose, right? Notice that for orthonormal bases, A transpose A is equal to identity. But, 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 wait, we learned previously that A inverse A is also equal to identity. Therefore, this matrix and this matrix must be the same. Must be the same. So under the, uh, under, uh, the case uh, of orthonormal bases, like we already realized multiple benefits. One is that AX is Y is just equal to X is equal to A transpose Y. Previously, Previously, it's A, A inverse X equals X inverse Y. So previously, it was A inverse Y, right? But since A inverse is just equal to the transpose, we just have to take the transpose. Okay? No, very, very special property. On the exam, if you, if you try to find the inverse, it is going to be really, really painful. In fact, maybe I should make that one of the questions. Say, uh, uh, so that like, if the people who didn't watch this video or didn't show up to class would essentially try to do this and fail miserably. Like th this time, this time I'm just going to tell you that you didn't watch the video. So that's your own fault. Okay, anyways, so I just showed you. Remember, I, you could do inverse, but since the inverse is just the transpose, that's all you need. Okay, so the next thing I believe is the Python code. Now, what I do is I generate a bunch of ran, a random vector, three by two random vector. Uh, I'm sorry, random matrix. And I want to show you how to write the normalized code. So this... If you run this normalization on A, it is going to take all the columns of A and make sure each one of them is normalized, which is has a length of one. I, and um, the other one is if you if you, you use one, I think, so axis one. If you do that, then I think it will make sure all the rows are normalized to the length of one. So this is how you, this is, this right here is how you normalize it. So now, now that I've normalized it, notice if I do B transpose B, because it's normalized, it gives us right here a, 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 um, a matrix. So the fact that it's one and one here, okay? So if you remember this, uh, the fact that it's one and one here means that it's unit length. But it's not orthogonal because when you multiply them with each other, it didn't give you zero. So ideally, you get a zero. Then you know it's orthonormal. But in this case, you know that this is not. Now, I haven't taught you guys this yet, but there's this thing called eigen decomposition. So I take some matrix, and this matrix can automatically generate. So it generates orthonormal basis. So the A now that came out of this is actually orthonormal basis. So I can show you that if I do A dot A transpose, notice it's an identity matrix. This was not an identity matrix. 
Therefore, they are normalized, but not orthogonal. But over here is normalized and orthogonal. Okay, and since the since the a transpose is just the inverse, I can put the a transpose here at the back, or I can put the a transpose at the front. A transpose dot a. You're still going to get identity because a transpose is the inverse. Now here, here, okay, so I printed out A. So this is what an orthonormal basis might look like. And then I printed out, I printed out the identity. And lastly, what I want to do is show you that if I just use A dot transpose dot Y, right? Because it's orth orthonormal basis, the solution is X. So I printed out the solution. Now, I'm going to use the traditional Gaussian elimination, solve. And that's, that's going to give me the solution as well. And notice the solution here and the solution here is identical. Right? You can solve it without Gaussian elimination by A transpose Y. That's it. That is very, very, very easy. <laughs> so I cannot emphasize enough that you need to know this property. Or else, under these conditions, you will probably never be able to solve. Like, good luck, all right? Good luck on the exam trying to solve um, by hand <laughs> Gaussian elimination for this. Like, you don't want to, you, you definitely don't want to do that. Now, I want you to test this idea yourself. I want you to solve, like, I want you to solve two problems AX equals to Y, BX equals to Y. Now, if you go to the course webpage under files, lecture, extra material, lecture nine, you should load three files. So, did I? Okay, not ortho, not ortho. Load that as B. Okay, load that as B. And then orthogonal, load that as A. So that's A here. And then orthogonal y, so load that as y. So you essentially now have a, a, y, and b, and y. Okay, so you can load these three files. Once you've done that, you want to use NumPy and verify that a is indeed orthonormal. So give this a try. And then you want to verify that b is not orthonormal. So give this a try. Once you've done that, compare the solution of a transpose y with linear algebra solve, okay? So basically, because A, remember A is orthonormal, therefore you can, you can solve the solution this way, and you can solve it this way, and they should give you exactly the same thing. And then you're gonna do it again with B, and that's gonna tell you, basically, that's not right, like this is not the solution. And the only difference between A and B is the fact that B is, not orthonormal. Therefore, orthonormality is a requirement for these special things to happen. Okay, so pause the video, give this a try, and then we'll move on. Okay, I'm moving on. Projection matrix. Now, when we project vector y onto a set of orthonormal bases like these, we can let the bases represent the column space of the matrix A. So we can stack all the basis vectors this way. And once we've stacked them, right, the matrix A has a special name. It's called projection matrix. So remember, projection is only, only specific to like orthonormal basis because, because you are like projecting onto a bunch of things, right? So you're projecting not just one vector, multiple. And, and it's special to orthonormal cases. And we're going to call the projection matrix, symbolically, it's commonly denoted with just P. Okay? We have previously shown you that orthonormal basis is very special. Okay? Now, projection matrix is commonly used to change the coordinate system. That's why it's normally used for. It's actually used pretty often for coordinate system. So, for example, given an object A in space, and an observer, B, 
Okay. If the observer is not moving, then whenever A is moving, it's just moving around the same coordinate. However, if the observer is moving around, okay, if the observer is moving, then the coordinate is actually constantly changing. So you have an object, you have an observer, right? So the observer is essentially the coordinate system. As the object moves, we've essentially learned how the object moves within a coordinate system. But the problem is the, the observer can move as well. So when the observer moves, then you need to make changes. So here is the example. Let's say this is the original observer. This is the basis used by this original observer. And this is the object it's observing. Now, pretend that the observer tilted his head by 45 degrees. So the new basis looks like this. But the point B did not move. The point B, the object is still the same, exact same location. It's the observer's perspective that changed. Okay? So let's say we have two vectors, u and two orthogonal bases. So over here is u and w and v. So w and v has rotated by 45 degrees. Now, 45 degrees. That's the same as if we like tilt our head for, by 45 degrees. So now we're in a different coordinate system. Even though the point B didn't move, right? According to the new coordinate system, the location of this is a different number. So the question is, how do we get the new coordinate of B? Right? How do we get... So this has some coordinate, which was... 0 0.61. But now this is the new basis. This is a new new set of bases. So what is the coordinate under this? Okay? So the answer is actually very simple. Step 1. You align the bases as columns. Step 2. You make sure that the bases are orthonormal. Okay? So make sure the bases are orthonormal. Then all you do is multiply your target onto the projection matrix, which I call a P previously. That's it. That's your new coordinate. That's how you got the new coordinate. Well, that might look like something we just saw. What was what did this look like? Well, that that was the solution. <laughs> that was the solution X from AX equals to Y. Right? is the coordinate of the new perspective. So, so the solution X, that is the new coordinate. So, so now, right, the new, the new coordinate will be, I don't know, whatever this distance is and whatever this distance is, right? So, so this works given the orthonormal basis. Now, let me, let me say this one more time. Right? How do you find the new coordinate system? Right, new coordinates given the new perspective. We just tilted our head. Once we tilted our head 45 degrees, the solution x from ax equals to y, which is you know a transpose y, that is the new coordinate system. So all you have to do is multiply them together. Okay, so now I want you to take a moment. I I don't think, yeah, I don't think these are orthonormal. So you got to normalize them first. So what I want you to do is find, just do a projection, alpha 1, alpha 2, and then find the V projection and W projection. So alpha 1, alpha 2, you may remember, is essentially the constants you have to multiply by. And these are the final locations of the, of the after the projection. And you can confirm that after you add them up, it's going to be the target. And you can find the error. Okay. And then you'll see, we'll see that alpha one and alpha two is actually the new coordinate once you solved it. Okay. Pause the video, give it a try, see if you can do it. Because I'm moving on. Okay. So in this case, over here, I've showed you essentially the steps to take. This is this is what you need to do to find the V pro W pro. Um, we've done this several times, so I'm going to jump out of that. 
But out of this, we found alpha one and alpha two. Now, if you had you like you could solve them separately, or you can solve them. Actually, you should probably solve them with a projection matrix. That that's better. Let's say you solve them with the projection matrix. You should get these two numbers. Therefore, those are the coefficient and the new coordinate here. And you can kind of see that this distance is this distance here is one point one three. This is one point, and you can see this is basically exactly where the projection is supposed to be. And this distance right here is zero point two a. And you can see also this is basically where the projection is. So under this new coordinate system, if you go this way by 1.13 and this way by 0.2a, you're going to get the new point. Okay, so this is really cool. This is a new coordinate. And this makes sense uh, since it tells you, it makes sense because alpha 1 and alpha 2 is telling you how much to multiply the unit vector by. All right, so it's saying that if you multiply the unit vector by 1.13, so the, the unit vector is probably right here, actually. If you multiply by this vector by 1.13, you're going to reach this point, which is, which is where its projection is. And again, if you were to add them together, right, it's going to get you the target coordinate back, which is 0.6. And one. Where's yeah? Here's the target. Here's the target coordinate. Okay. So important observations: alpha one and alpha two. Remember they're called coefficients, but they're also called the coordinates. Like right? hence they give you the coordinates of the new orientation. If the vector spans the point, then the summation of the projected vector will give you the original vector. Now, if the vector, they do not span the point, the projected vectors will not give you the original vector, but it will give you the best approximation with some error. So the span, the span has two cases. If it does span or if it doesn't span, spans it, no error. Does not span, definitely some error, okay? So, I think I showed you over here. If you let if you let these bases be the columns of the matrix, the columns, and then you multiply it by your target, that gives you the new new coordinate. We talked about this already, so it's just a reminder. Okay. So this is with just one point. So remember how we did a bunch of transformations. You basically have a vector and you multiply by the transformation. But if you have multiple points, like U1, U2, U3, you similarly would stack them this way. Okay? We'll call that U. And then you can do the transformation of all these points simultaneously by P transpose U. Now, you can imagine previously we had like a a person, right? Previously, we had a person, and there are a couple, several points for this person. There are several points for this person. Now, if you want to do a, a a perspective shift, so this person can move to the right, or you can move to the left. If you move to the left, it's equivalent to this person moving to the right, right? So, in terms of perspective, so. When you want to move to the left, in that case, well, then you don't want to do each one of these points, right? You don't want to do the projection matrix, uh, the projection matrix one at a time. And I'm saying that if you just stack all the U's together, each column, then you can transform this perspective simultaneously for every single point. Okay, this is how all the points are done. Now, as an aside, like right now we've been talking about spaces, points in space, and and I want you to like this is one thought I always had. 
that information in a way right is kind of like a point in space like if i tell you dog dogs love gps right we can see this sentence as a three dimensional space right so x could be dog and then there's the concept of love And then the third one would be GP. So, so under this condition, most of you, I assume, would understand what dog and love means. You will know what dog. Therefore, you will have some kind of concept of a dog. And then you will have some kind of concept of love. However, however, if you don't know what GP is, the closest understanding you can reach is this point. You cannot get, you, you will always have some kind of error. Because without knowing what GPs are, you have no idea what this point would be. Right? So, so the third dimension, you probably don't know it. And in this case, in this case, like the concept of span is really, really important. Right, and when we don't understand something, this is why, like, we have errors. And from this perspective, you can see why the same event can be seen completely differently from two people, because you can imagine every one of us has a different set of bases. Like, like my concept of a dog may be like this. Right, my dog dog and love might be this but yours could be completely differently orientated like rotated translated just different and depending on the basis that we have i may i have the basis of gp right so i know i i span this point so when i read this sentence i know exactly what that point means however you guys are going to see this therefore in that in those cases there is a difference between what you see and what I see. Okay. So as we learn various facts in life, we slowly form our own sets of unique bases, animal feelings, etc. And when we experience something new, new, we may not have the words or the correct basis to understand it. That is, the basis we have does not span the information. Okay, so 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 this is actually the way I was able to grasp the idea of spans and bases, because if, if in my opinion it really reflects, like it's a good model of our mind. Uh, by the way, GP is just a machine learning model. Okay, so for the final final thing, you want to use Python to solve the following problems. You have two targets, and these are the bases, okay? Or first, I want you to check if the vectors are orthogonal with each other. So, or check orthogonality. Next, check orthonormality, okay? So orthogonality just requires that the, di the diagonal are zero. Orthonormality requires, sorry, the off diagonal. That. Orthogonality requires the off diagonal diagonal to be zero. Orthonormality requires that the diagonal equals to one. Okay, then you want to form the projection matrix that's orthonormal once you identify these two. And then put Y1 and Y2 into a matrix and project them simultaneously so project these two points onto the new perspective given the new projection matrix. Okay. Then lastly, what is the new coordinate under the new coordinate system? And then solve orthonormal basis, right? You don't use Gaussian elimination for this. <laughs> solve both of them, right, using the orthonormal basis idea. Okay. Um, I guess that's that's the whole video. So 
we're all set. Um, I will see you in the next video.